uh, and internationally known hydrometeorologist, Professor Surush Surushian, is a distinguished professor of civil and environmental engineering and earth system science departments and director of the Center for Hydrometeorology and Remote Sensing at University of California, Irvine. His area of expertise include the interface of global hydrologic cycle and climate system. He has supervised over 50 PhD students who hold prominent positions in academia, government, and private sector, both in the US and abroad. Professor Sarosian is a member of the prestigious US National Academy of Engineering, the International Academy of Astronautics, and the World Academy of Sciences. Among his other honors, he was recently named the 2014 Einstein Professorship by the Chinese Academy of Sciences. In the 2013, he was the recipient of the American Geophysical Union's Robert E. Horton Medal. He's the recipient of the 2010 Fourth Prince Sultan bin Abdul Aziz International Prize for Water Resources Management and Protection. He's the recipient of the 2005 NASA Distinguished Public Service Medal. He is also the recipient of the 2012 Eagle Sin um, Lectureship Consortium of Universities for the Advancement of Hydrologic Science. Honorary Professor at Beijing Normal University China in 2010. He's also named the Walter O. Roberts Lecturer, American Meteorological so Society in 2009. He's the recipient of AMS Robert E. Horton Memorial Lectureship, which was in 2006. And the William Nordberg Memorial Lecture at the NASA Goddard Space, Space Flight Center in 2004. Professor Sarosian has served on numerous advisory committees, including those of which I'm only naming three, NASA, NOAA, and UNESCO. He has testified to both U.S. House of Representatives and U.S. Senate committees on issues related to water, climate, and satellite programs. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Sarosian on stage. Thank you, Armity, for a very kind introduction. I, I think it's still morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm honored that the uh, organizing committee uh, also decided to have a little better science uh, mixed with religion. And uh, I hope I don't disappoint you. I am between you and the lunch, which is going to be promised to be a delicious one. So I hope I build up your appetite. Uh, 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 I should say that all the accomplishments Amriti was kindly acknowledging uh, all pale compared to my ability to convince uh, Shirin uh, to marry me uh, 40 years. <laughs> As you see, I'm a very emotional person. And she's put up with me, and we have two sons that are well accomplished in their own right. So getting that off my chest, I'm ready to move on, Armity was kind enough to say much of the research I've done has been funded by NASA, NOAA, U.S. Army Research Office, UNESCO, the World Bank, and the National Science Foundation. So uh, bear with me as I learn how to maneuver this one. Uh, I went the opposite direction. Uh, I am at the University of California, Irvine. Before that, for 20 years, I was at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And uh, I usually acknowledge the group of people that work with me. Armity mentioned that I've had the pleasure of working with 50 doctoral students. Uh, these are some of the ones that are most recently working with me, truly an international group. 
And I'm proud to say that a good number from India and Iran have been part of it, unfortunately no Parsis. And I should say a few of them have been educated at the University of Shiraz that I'm honored to have Dr. Mir, its uh, uh, president uh, during the Shah era, uh, to be in the audience. Uh, well, also a little promotion and advertisement, my center, uh, which by the way, proudly uh, was honored by the, uh, the royal family of Saudi Arabia for my development of the Persian system, which is an algorithm for ex ex extracting information from satellites of uh, global rainfall estimates. Uh, and if the royal family had no problem that I was being awarded for the development of the Persian algorithm. Of course, it has two ends as opposed to one. But uh, for those of you who have mobile devices and you like to know how much rain is falling anywhere around the world, you can download Rain Mapper, and uh, it's at no cost. Uh, let me start with just taking a little journey uh, about 35,000 kilometer above the Earth from the middle of the Amazon forest to really get an appreciation for the planet that uh, we live on. Uh, this is, of course, in a matter of few seconds. Uh, I don't think satellites and even uh, space uh, launch vehicles travel that fast, but for the sake of the time that I'm allocated, it serves the purpose. You see we have a blue planet, we have a green planet, we've got the clouds, we have an incredibly unique planet, and where we sit in the solar system is really also important that here is Earth in terms of its proximity to Sun. Which, which really is the heat engine of our planetary and universe. Uh, Earth is the second one. There is the Venus and there is the Mars. And we won't talk about the rest of them uh, because there is no time. But uh, in terms of why we are located and why is it so unique that life can exist on Earth is really remarkable. So let's go with the Venus, which is closest to the sun. It's really contains 96% of its atmosphere, and most Zoroastrians are knowledgeable people, so you know chemistry and mathematics and others, is about 96% of it is, uh, is uh, carbon dioxide. And that's why the greenhouse effect is truly operational, and the average temperature of that planet is about 420 degrees centigrade. And don't forget, 100 degrees centigrade is when water is boiling and you don't want to put your finger in there, okay? The second one I will talk about is farther away from our uh, Earth uh, and away from the Sun is Mars. It has a very thin atmosphere. It's almost, um, m much of the CO2 is in the ground. It's frozen in the ground. And the average temperature of that planet is 50 degrees minus. Uh, and that's pretty harsh. What is unique about Earth is that the average temperature of our planet is about 15 degrees centigrade. Of course, we have the cold and the warm, but when you mathematically average it, it's about 15 degrees. And the uniqueness of our planet is that the composition of the atmosphere and the chemistry that really makes us what we are. 78% is nitrogen, 21% is oxygen. Without it, we wouldn't be breathing. And then 1% is other gases. And this much of the controversy about global warming really centers about that 1%, and only a fraction of that, 0.03%, or 300 milligrams per liter, on the average, is the amount of concentration of the greenhouse gases, CO2, in the atmosphere. So the whole debate has been that with the industrial age and the past 100 years, we have been rising this level. And this is what's going to cause us some problems, and there are already evidence of that. So moving forward, I tried, but thank you for some of the speakers today, try to give a little bit of perspective in terms of our religion and where it stands. And I'm happy to hear this morning's speakers talk maybe science was a driving force of our religion. So whether we believe in the Big Bang Theory, and the black holes and the evolutionary theories of Darwin, or we believe in creationism, the belief that the universe and life originated from specific acts of divine creation. And I hope we stand behind the science because uh, obviously we have a very rich human brain can do remarkable things. And uh, one of the things happens to be that within the planetary system that we are, 
it is remarkable how human brain and thinking of uh, Newtonian mechanics and Einstein's theory of relativity and calculus, we've been able to put it all together where we know the position of Earth with respect to the rest of the solar system, if you wish, 100 years into the future within the precisions of seconds. And uh, this is remarkable. So in the totality of it, the universe is well represented and modeled and we can predict exactly where we are with respect to any other planetary bodies um, with such a remarkable accuracy. And yet, within each of these planets itself, rules chaos and nonlinearity, and that's why we are unable to predict, for instance, the weather in a few weeks from now, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let me move on. And one of the evidence of how accurate we are able to do this is that some of you heard recently about the Rosetta mission, which was really conceived back before 2000. And in 2014, it was launched with a travel time, a distance of six billion kilometers, making all these loops to eventually come to this particular comet and to land on this comet 10 years, nine months, and 28 days later, and rendezvous was about 24 million kilometers away from our planet, and they were able to achieve it. The margin of error of how wonderful the science is thanks to computational capabilities that computers give was within 100 kilometers error, which they could already adjust it and make sure that it lands. It did land, unfortunately, it didn't land the way they wanted it, but it was enough to send some evidence that in fact the comets that are believed to hold water, this one did not have much water on it, okay? So this is of course one of the things that it is. Back to Earth. It's blue, green, and it's alive. And I'd like to put much of my emphasis for the rest of it on this particular aspect. So when I was taught the three, three things in Zoroastrianism, good deed, good words, and good thoughts, we were also told that, in fact, there are four elements that we should really care for. And one of them was the earth or the dirt. It's the energy and the fire. And then we have the weather and the winds. And last but not least is water. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time to talk about each one of these things. First, let me start with the structure of the earth, our planet. Structure of our planet, as you see, I'm going through for 700 million years of history of our planet as how it came to be what it is today. I go back and allow you within 10 seconds to see 700 million years of how our planet was shaped and formed. Okay, ready? This is how it is, at least based on geological evidence of that we came together and we split and this is what the present condition of our planet is. This is 240 million years ago this is 60 million years ago, and this is today, and God knows, or someone knows what it will be 60 million years from now, okay? We know that the Alps are increasing. The Southern Alps are growing by about one inch every 10 years because they're putting pressures against each other thanks to these tectonic plates that have been discovered and are actually, it's almost the Earth is like an egg, cracked egg, and we have the mobility to adjust these things and unfortunately comes with it sometimes the earthquakes that really are very destructive and unpredictable, unfortunately. So these are all the where much of the activities on the plate te tectonics of our planet are. And in fact, that mobility that the planet has also helps for us to survive the way we are. Let me move on to the energy and the heat. And that is, of course, the most fundamental part of our our existence. Our own planet in its core, and that's about 6,000 kilometers radius. At its core, it's solid. It's highly dense iron. And then you get to the outer core, which is liquid. Hot, about 6,000 degrees centigrade. Again, don't forget, 100 degrees, when you put water, your hand in the water, you're burned. That's about six thousand degrees centigrade and that is actually the heat engine within the planet itself 
and as you come to the surface, and then where we live on the crust of the, the earth, you don't feel much of that heat, except sometimes you see these thermal activities and the heat that comes through the cracks, as well as uh, the volcanoes and so on and so forth. But on the average, the temperature is kept as at 15 degrees centigrade. And one of the big questions is whether the planet is actually getting cooler into interior. Yes, it is getting cooler, but relax. It is cooling by about one degree every one million years. Okay, and why is it important? Because the center of the molten part of the, um, the, the core of our planet is what creates the magnetic field that protects us from the sun. Okay? And, of course, volcanoes are important because the ash that is produced by the volcanoes when it gets to the stratosphere where above the plains, uh, where the 35,000 um, feet above the earth, where the plains travel, the sulfate that they put cools the planet. So in terms of the global warming, you should not mind when volcanoes are active because they have proven to be a cooling agent for our planet. The sun. The core of the sun is 15 million degrees hot. At the surface, when we have sun flares, this is 6,000 degrees centigrade. And hopefully, if my animation works, sometimes you hear of the solar flares. They travel towards our planet in a rather rapid speed, creating plasma. If it wasn't the magnetic field created by the core of the Earth, we would be fried and barbecued, we wouldn't exist as we are today. So this is the unique part, and that's why understanding the way our planet works is so crucial to see where the future goes. All right, well, we get the heat from the sun, thanks to the red core that keeps us a little bit more controlled, not to be completely burned by the plasma, but then some of that energy that we get, the radiation, is reflected back to the atmosphere. And when they talk about global warming and the greenhouse effect, is that that shield that is created through sea gases like CO2 and methane, and even water vapor, is creating an atmosphere almost like a greenhouse. When you go in it, it's a little hot. And this is exactly what is expected that is, the planet is going through at the present time. Atmospheric circulation and winds. Without that, we wouldn't have weather, okay? In the northern hemisphere, of course, the winds blow from west to the east, and therefore, as a result of that, when you're flying from here to Europe in the northern hemisphere, your travel time is less than coming back because you're going with the wind behind you. And in the southern hemisphere, it's just the opposite. And that's the Coriolis effect for those who are interested. This courtesy of my son, Armin, uh, represents two years of data as how the gases in the atmosphere circulate around the Earth. Okay, these are the aerosols. And what is in the aerosols are all kinds of stuff. For instance, the blue color that you see represents uh, uh, salt that is from the oceans. The brownish color that you see is the dust, and the white color you see is the, the CO2 uh, from mass, mass burning of the uh, jungles and, and forests. And uh, the other color, uh, I forgot which one it was, it's the green. And the green is the sulfate, sulfate that is created from volcanoes and others. So, in the atmosphere, things travel rather fast. You will see that these are, for instance, some typhoons hitting the Asian continent, and within them, they pick up a lot of salt, as you see. But the key thing is that we are all connected. Whatever is in the atmosphere travels from China to the United States in the way of dust and others, or from Africa, within days, and you're not even aware of it. So the pollution that is caused someplace else it's not necessarily their problem, it's your problem, and our causing the same thing is the problem of somebody else. And this is exactly where the com complexities of understanding the planet Earth become, because these are so dynamic and so hard to understand as compared to the solar system. Well, we talk about mapping uh, biomass burning. 
this is two years of data uh, com compiled by NASA that shows where on our planet people are burning forests, whether naturally or otherwise. And it's remarkable to see, for instance, in Africa and even in South America, how much um, biomass burning takes place. And of course, uh, we've had sometimes forest fires in uh, Siberia and others in India, but predominantly these are the areas where they can they cause a lot of the aerosols that get into our atmosphere. Coming to the ocean circulation and water. Oceans are the engine of our climate system. The waters that are in blue color are deep waters, and they could be there hundreds of thousands of years. Or the surface waters are warmer because they get the solar heat, and they can even be within minutes that the rain falls and it's evaporated back to the atmosphere. But as a whole, that is the heat engine of our planet atmosphere. And if it slows down, it's known that has caused the little ice age, for instance, in, in Europe. Hydrologic cycle is dear to my heart because uh, we study it, and that's what my group does. And you know that the amount of water on the planet is fixed. And what goes up must come down. When water evaporates and forms clouds, like it did in Los Angeles, it's only there for only 10 days. So it comes back rather rapidly and recharges the aquifer systems and flows from the surface of the earth. Now, this is a student, interestingly enough, uh, one of the things I guess I'm proud of, everybody who is in the water business or a student that is interested, they know I'm Zoroastrian. So I always send me quotes from the Zoroastrian writings. And this is from a fellow student, uh, Isaac Moradi, in Sweden, who sent me this for a new year a few years ago, 2009 actually. And he had seen this translation, and I hope this is true, maybe the scholars know. And it seems it, like this, even in Avesta there is a reference to the water cycle. It says, heated by the actions of the sun, the water then rises from the sea, rising in the sky, till it forms these thunderous clouds. They rain down on my command, now that's a little, I don't know, but to, to give rise to crops and food for mankind to nourish the thirsty earth, thus is the cycle complete. Of course, hydrologic cycle never ends and it continues on and it goes on. The big question is of course the relationship of these four elements to, to the climate and how the future uh, shapes for us. Whether our planet is warming or has already, it has already been addressed. Scientific evidence is there, and if you are non-believer, then you can only look at the way glaciers are, because those are slow-moving things and they change very slowly. And in the Alps, in India, with South America, etc., you see that pictures that were taken maybe at, at the beginning of the 20th century and the recent one, you see how much these uh, uh, glaciers have receded and they've gone back. That is an indication that warming is taking place. And on the average, the past 100 years, the globe as a whole has seen maybe one to two degrees increase in temperature. So the million dollar question, or whatever currency you like to use, is who is responsible for the warming? And is it nature or us? Now, if you are and that, by the way, is at the intersection of the natural system that we as scientists try to understand and study, politics and religion. In fact, global warming issue, if you're a denier or a believer, is really the central core of what is really facing humanity for the future. And politicians who are total deniers of this of course, use religion as an excuse, particularly in the United States, and I won't main parties, but you can imagine the conservatives, who are believers that God, who has created this earth because they believe in creationism. If it was bad for us, okay, it would prevent it. So therefore, don't worry about global warming, burn gasoline, burn fossil fuel, and God will take care of you. I hope our religion is much more smarter and I wish they would speak to this particular issue. 
physics of climate and water and the rest of our planet is very straightforward and there are equations you can find in the book. As the temperature of the Earth goes up, you can evaporate water, you can experiment that in your kitchen. Don't burn anything on my account, but anyhow, you warm up the water, you will see that evaporation takes place. Also, as you increase the temperature of the atmosphere, the belly or the stomach of the atmosphere to receive more moisture increases without the size. For roughly every 20 degrees increase in the atmospheric temperature, you can double the capacity of the atmosphere to receive water. So therefore, you put more water in the atmosphere. What goes up must come down. Every 10 to 12 years is the average residence time of water in the atmosphere, and then that comes back. So your argument is going to be, well, that global warming might be good because you get more rainfall coming from the oceans. It's not that straightforward, and that's one of the most complicated questions because it's a regional issue. And also, the, the water itself is a greenhouse gas, okay? So it's a good greenhouse gas, but still, it's a greenhouse. What is happening at the present time is that the combination of the climate and global warming is manifesting itself in what we call the intensification of the hydrologic cycle. We see more droughts, more frequency of floods, and severe floods, okay? It's not average but it increases and it's going to cause devastation and problems for us. Los Angeles back in 1955, floods are not new. Downtown Los Angeles was flooded like this. Okay, this is Houston, Texas, a few years ago. And you see a lot of this happening all around the world. Droughts are what really causes us to worry about, and particularly in California. And this is one of the most magnificent lakes, if you haven't been there, Lake Powell built on the Colorado River. A few years ago, 40 meters drop in the height of the water in this reservoir. It has recovered some, but it hasn't. And this is what is facing Western United States in terms of the amount of availability of the water. So what can we say about future stresses on water resources? I've already told you. We have all these problems to face. But what is certain about it is the population impact, because we know through demographics that the population of the Earth has increased and is likely to increase. The part that is uncertain, and unfortunately it's a burden on the scientists, is the climate impact on dealing with the politics and the religion that really makes people believe that we should not worry about any of these things. Population, all these circles represent cities with different sizes of population. Asia, is blessed with having very high de degree of population, India 1.1, China 1.4 billion at the present time. And it's, what's interesting is from 1970 to 2010, migration of people from farms to cities has resulted in cities exploding, exploding in their size. Okay, so this is causing a lot of issues with respect to the demographics. The world population last year surpassed 7 billion, and by 2025, it's estimated to be at 8.3 billion. That's not a joke, okay? We have to feed a lot of people over the period. Interestingly enough, if you look at the preference of people where they live, about 40% of the total population multiplied by seven, okay, so you get an idea of about 3 billion or so, love to live near the coastlines. So they're within 150 kilometers of the coastlines. So when you talk about sea level rise, this is where the issues sometimes pop up. But this is gonna be an important matter for us to worry about, but at the same time you could argue with respect to water, you're sitting next to vast oceans, so why are you complaining about not having water? Unless we like salty water or we have the amount of energy to produce and get fresh water out of it. Where is the water used mostly? By some countries, let's say we talk about Iran and India, since uh, most people probably are from these regions. 95% of the total water is used in agriculture. So when your kid comes to school, that the teacher said, mom, don't leave the faucet on when you're brushing your teeth. That's a good, it's good to practice, but at the end of the day, it's agriculture that is consuming a lot of water. And we are remarkable in terms of how much efficiency we have gained in terms of water 
better irrigation. People may have heard of what we call virtual water. These days, what is produced in the United States is shipped to many places in the world in the form of grain. Okay, so that's water. So in a way, indirectly, water is being transported to other continents through container ships and others. So this is a fascinating diagram by people who are really following how much commodities exchange hands these days and move around. So Saudi Arabia, for instance, has decided that it's crazy for them to use some of their water, and therefore they've come and bought huge parcel of land in Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and they've shifted much of their agriculture to that region to save their own water under the ground. So how do we, as humans, deal with these issues? The primary solution to satisfy water resources needs, because I'm, I'm switching to the water and the importance of that in our religion, uh, is the, and to deal with the hydrologic extremes. Floods are devastating, droughts are devastating, and so on, has been the engineering approach. So I know a lot of Zoroastrians like engineering, maybe more medicine, but anyhow, the few who are engineers should be proud of what they've been able to accomplish. We control the water, we store it, we pump it, and transfer it thanks to the technologies in the last century. Uh, in the old days, ingenuity of how we preserve water, the cities of Yazd and Kerman were mentioned. They're not close to any major river. They had to save the water and deal with it. So a lot of these Aban bars, right? This one, we took a picture of this uh, on the way to Pirisat. So here is a little trickle of water. Maybe for those days it was pro probably adequate, okay? We have these beautiful, beautiful Aban bars in the city of Yaz. So they were, talk about optimization. People in those days, thousands of years ago, knew where to locate these things that if they travel between Kerman and Yaz, they don't run out of water. To collect the water, harvest the water, and store it in these tanks, and put a dome because they wanted to reduce the evaporation. Maybe not science behind it, but it did. Thousands of years ago, I guesstimate that Asia this damn near this, my city of Kerman, which was really remarkable. It's still, the structure is there, and apparently with eggshell and others they mix and they make something that is much stronger than concrete, that they put these things together. And these days, of course, we build the new versions of the dams, concrete, and humongous structures, and we use it for multi-purposes. Canals, you know, maybe way before thousands of years before Newton was there to talk about gravity, people, common sense told them that if you want to get water from point A to point B, you better build canals, and these bridges you see in Rome or in, in Italy are evidence of how they move water from one point to the other, taking advantage of the gravity. You go to the city of Petra, you know, in, uh, in Jordan, the current Jordan, 312 BC, with the capital city of this particular area, you see these carvings in the sandstone? Was how they got water to the central part of Petra. I hope if you haven't been there, it's one remarkable place to go and visit. Well, now, of course, we don't have those little ditches and carvings in the sandstone. We have these gigantic structures, aqueduct systems, that bring water. This is from the one that takes water from Colorado River to the central part of the state of Arizona. $5 billion spent on this particular project, but with that goes salt and many other things. United States, if you want to look at the history of dam building in the United States, we don't build any more dams because they're not environmentally good. There were 70,000 dams built in the United States by year 2000. China has just surpassed about 85,000, reaching to another maybe 15 or so thousand to build. Uh, groundwater. It's under the ground, you don't see it, but it's one of the most critical waters for the desert uh, environments, and unfortunately, we have reached an unsustainable situation. It's the water that is collected between the cracks. Persia, and there's historical evidence. In its empire that was mentioned in Malcolm's talk earlier, 
were the ones who really were the ones who promoted the use of kanats throughout the, the in Persian Empire, okay? And kanats are really remarkable things, that they go and find the source of the water, dig these holes and connect it, and through gravity, again, water flows under the ground. Not an easy one. These are some of the people who work to build these canals. And uh, thanks to my colleague Hassani Zadeh, he gave me these uh, slides. And how could they, in those days, know that they can dig these holes 30 or 40 meters apart, and then a group digging from under the ground this canal or the tunnel from this side, and they meet at the same point? That's engineering. And you know how they did it? with the use of light and mirrors in order to know from one side to the other to be pretty much precise about it. Well, uh, this is an old fashioned way. They, they maintain these things and it's not really easy work. And this is what comes out. Unfortunately, most canals in Iran are completely gone and dried up because of, of course, we have these ways by which you now drill the holes and pump the water out and uh, and then, unfortunately, this has become a very unsustainable situation. But I'm proud to say if Mr. Yagana Gi is in the room, his family have been really instrumental in the development of water resources in Iran. But I think they've always done it in a very conscientious way with permits. I understand in the Urubia region of Iran at the present time, there are 80,000 wells that are not permit, uh, without permits. So here is Orumia Lake. I don't know if some of you may have heard. I'm taking you for about 30 years of history of Orumia Lake to the present time, which is perhaps one of the major environmental disasters, at least facing in that part of the world. The size of the lake has shrunk to what you see in the last slide that was about a year ago. Okay, this is Lake Orumia for you. Why? Because all the dams that have been built here, much of the water that has been coming to the lake naturally has been prevented. And next week, myself and Shirin are going to Iran as a part of a delegation to look at some of these issues. Groundwater. It's underground, you don't see it. San Joaquin Valley, California. This is where the land used to be in 1925. Too much pumping, sedimentary basin, everything has gone down. About 15 meters the land has gone down uniformly, okay? And they stopped it back in 75 and started buying water from others to try to build up the aquifer system again. Kerman, Iran, okay, the geology is different. You see it more through these kinds of fractures and cracks through the earth and the sinkholes because of too much water that has been pumped out of the ground. Well, on the bright side of things, and to end my talk, is technology and information is becoming really incredible in terms of how we deal with the future and uh, understanding these problems and trying to deal with them. Satellites are not only to stay and study the solar system, but we have plenty of them circling the Earth as we sit here and try to understand what's happening here. The eye of human being can only see this range in the electromagnetic spectrum. There's a lot to be seen, and snakes don't have eyes, but they see outside of this range of the human eye so do the satellite sensors. So through these, we can understand the difference between a healthy plant and a wilting plant. And these are some of the satellites that are used by my group to map rainfall over the globe every, 30, uh, every three hours. So we, every three hours, we can map the amount of rainfall over the globe, and that's important in the context of understanding how the climate changes in the future. And there are other satellites. This one is a part of the Earth Observing System of NASA that I had the pleasure of being involved with. It's the size of a school bus with 15 different equipments on this, each one measuring from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of the Earth, and even about three or four inches under the ground measuring the moisture, and in the ocean maybe meters. And that information in terms of the chemistry, in terms of the, how the environment is changing is becoming very important in terms of our study of the Earth. This one and its sister are circling the Earth um, since 2005 and sending immense amounts of information. Technology in terms of water quality, 
has improved immensely. Uh, you can go anything from this quality to a purity that is better than fresh water you get out of uh, nature. And desalination technology is really improving a lot and maybe become cost effective if we find a way to deal with the energy issue. And as a result of that, water will never be short for water as long as we understand there is a cost to pay for water. Free water is, is hard to come by. My concluding slide is that despite advances to date, predicting the future, climate will remain a major challenge, and I hope more younger Zoroastrians would come and try to study and help in this area. Nature is complex, and observing and modeling its behavior, chaotic behavior, is not easy. So we keep working on it, and so will the future generation, okay? Thank you very much for your time. And since I have behaved really well, I had a video clip that was produced uh, by a center, UNESCO center at Yazd, known as Kanat Center, Kanat. And this young producer, uh, her name is Pago um, Kolipur, was kind enough to give me this complimentary copy. And it's about Zoroastrians and water in the city of Yaz. And I think it's nice to run that if you would be kind enough. It's called Kauris. And it builds up the appetite for lunch. <laughs> I hope the sound is loud. And she's not Zoroastrian, by the way. And she made this film for the opening of an international conference at Yaz. Is there any sound? Maybe I had it on silent in my... Thank you. It's all about its sound, by the way. It's not the pictures. Because I think I put it on silent on my speaker.
I think it can't stop it there, but anyhow, it sort of represents. I guess I'll take questions after lunch or during the lunch, and thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Sorosian, for a very informative talk. That's one more extra thing to think about and worry about. <laughs> and this is a small token Thank of appreciation so from the organizers. Thank you very much. Also, I've been notified that people are going to start to come in for lunch. So as Professor Surushian said, if there are any questions, please uh, approach him off the stage and uh, during or preferably after lunch. Thank you, everyone.